Welcome to the Crisis, Conflict, and Emergency Management Podcast, where we have global conversations and share perspectives about international crisis, preparedness, and how to build more resilient societies. My name is Kyle, and I will be your host. And just how vulnerable are we to the changing international environment, and what can we learn from this experience? From AI to space warfare to community development and crisis communications, there's something here for everyone. Join us for unique international conversations and perspectives into the current threats, challenges, and risks to our society. This podcast is brought to you by Capacity Building International and sponsored by the International Emergency Management Society. And Ricardo, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Kyle. A pleasure. First, I I think a congratulations is, is in order. Uh, you have recently retired from the United Nations platform. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. After 29 years of uh, service in the UN, I decided to take retirement as I was already entitled to. So yeah, starting a new life. Well, congratulations. I'm sure you've seen quite a lot in those 29 years, especially in the in the field of disaster risk reduction. And so I really wanted to bring you on to be able to talk about sort of what, what are you seeing in, in terms of DRR over this? What's changed over the last few decades that you've been working on this topic? And sort of where do you think that we're going in terms of this overall risk reduction platform? So I know that's a broad question, but let's sort of draw down first on what sort of change, what sort of massive changes have you seen in the, in the last 10 or 15 years? Yeah, well, I would say that the most important change I have seen is that the overall understanding of disaster management and risk reduction has been evolving and moving from uh, something that was mainly focused on the hazards themselves into the other aspects of the risk formula, which are basically the vulnerability conditions of people living in exposed areas to different types of hazards. And little by little, this understanding has been sinking in and making the connections between the issues of vulnerability and exposure with the overall issue of sustainable development. And in a way, what what we have uh, come to realize is that uh, most of the aspects that uh, make people vulnerable to the impact of hazards is really linked very closely with the way in which development has been taking place. And if this development has not been risk-informed, it has generated a big amount of uh, risk that is manifested when the hazard actually occurs. So um, the understanding that the only way we can fix this is by really addressing the underlying drivers of risk and what needs to be done from the development side to ensure that societies are more resilient and not so exposed and vulnerable to the effects of the hazards. And this has gone, you know, over these past 30 years or so, First, the people engaged in disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management were mainly people from the engineering side and the experts in the hazards, the geologists, the volcanologists, the hydrometeorologists, etc. And then it started moving a bit into the uh, sphere of the social sciences. And then all the people who, who, who study the uh, way in which uh, communities develop and in which uh, governments actually do development started to engage. And that's when this change between the focus on the hazard and, and the focus on the vulnerability started to, to happen. And then, of course, the development actors that were somehow more engaged with just the situation as it happened started seeing that indeed it was very important how that development was taking place in either creating new risks or reducing the possibility of impact in the, in the future. So I would say that, you know, broadly speaking, this, this has been a, a major shift in the way w- which we understand disaster risk. And of course, we have had a lot of events that have been leading us in that way, which, of course, climate change has been one because the increase in the frequency and intensity of the hazards has been going up. And people have started realizing that, in fact, oh, wow, 
yeah, you know, we should have had this in mind when we were st- first developing our cities or our activities uh, and our balance with nature that uh, we didn't, and, and now we are paying the price. So this thing, and of course, recently in these past two years, the interconnection in which we currently live in our in our current society has made it manifest that something that happens very far away can actually have an impact on people that are absolutely disconnected from the event itself. So the pandemic was one, one uh, virus that has created uh, what we have already seen, a worldwide impact with, with uh, lots of losses and, and, and losses of life and economic impact. And also the event in uh, Ukraine with the invasion from Russia that has had a great impact in many areas that could not have been potentially be anticipated. For example, the cost of food uh, items and, and the problems with the supply chain and, and the inflation that is you know, growing and still going up in many countries, many developed nations particularly, and issues with energy supply and so on and so forth. So almost everything is somehow connected. And this is what we need to also take stock of the fact that risk has to be looked at in a more comprehensive way. We cannot look at each hazard independently, but we have to see at the possibility of cascading effects and ripple effects that are caused by something that triggers other hazards and can have, of course, a greater impact on on society. So it, it's quite exciting because you know the topic is still quite dynamic, and also the risk is quite dynamic, and our risk profiles keep changing. You know, I don't want to extend myself, but I I, I think I highlighted some of the key issues of how this topic has evolved over the years. I think there's been a, a lot of change, really, in perspectives and the people that are involved, the actors involved in the the risk reduction space. When you first started in this type of career path or in this field, what were the topics that you were talking about then versus the topics that you're talking about today? Just as a simple example. Yeah, you know, when I just started, I started working in an emergency preparedness program. So, of course, everything was focused on preparing to respond better. It was not so much about how can we reduce the risk so that the impact is not so big? It was just how to prepare better so that we can respond and alleviate suffering uh, to people that have been affected. So that was the emphasis. So it was pretty much emergency management, preparedness, response, and uh, you know the awareness raising in, in people to one hazard that they were exposed to. So it was very specific to either earthquakes or tsunami or volcanic eruptions or tropical uh, cyclones. It was very much hazard focused and pretty much dealing basically with the actions after the impact has already occurred. What I want to highlight is the fact that this keeps being very important because we still uh, have been generating new risks and we are perhaps more exposed and in some places more vulnerable than, than ever. So the probability of governments and communities to respond to disasters keep being as important or more even as it was 30 years ago. But what we have also started looking at is the fact that really, if we want to solve the problem and make sustainable development really durable, then we need to focus more on that side of the equation. And we have to look at uh, what are the land use planning uh, policies and and how is our engagement with uh, nature being managed? How are we taking care of uh, nature-based solutions to reduce disaster risk, for example? How are we taking care of nature and the ecosystem in general to avoid that as a factor that will even compound the risks to a greater extent. And also looking at all the actions that can be taken ex ante to make sure that the the impact is not so great, including insurance, of course, but also other financial mechanisms 
that can help improve the response at the same time that it will diminish the probability of impact. So all these forecast-based financing, for example, and other approaches that have been developed over the past years are actually uh, looking more at the preventive and the prospective views of uh, risk than in the past. And of course, the, the issue has also become quite political because as, as we have seen in many countries, if governments do not handle well a disaster response, then they may be held liable and they may lose the interest of their constituencies for their political party. And uh, because of the increasing frequency and intensity of events, this is happening more frequently. So this is becoming indeed also an issue that has to be put on into the table from the political party's side to have this discussion and try to address it in a more uh, effective way. The problem there is that investments in this in, in risk reduction are not visible in the immediately. It takes time. For example, if a mayor decides to increase the capacity of the water drainage system to cope with the increase of precipitation because of climate change, well, first, it's quite costly sometimes. And secondly, it's going to take years until the community looks at the benefits of that investment and then what it has brought. So politically, let's say the profitability of risk reduction is not so great as other things that are visibly more needed. So we are somehow in that area now, and, and we need to make sure that the long-term view keeps being quite important for uh, how our leaders and, and elected officials manage the tasks that they have. You know, 30 years ago, we were not speaking too much about the possibility of sea level rise because of climate change. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, even 50 years ago, this was, you know, quite something that was just being written by a few authors, but that was it. Now we are leaving it already and we are suffering from the consequences of it. And this is a way, you know, a, a good example to use to explain that, that this long term view has to be factored in into all these uh, development processes and political processes. Because if we focus all on the immediate gratification and, you know, all, all these investments that can show and reap some political benefit in the short term, then, of course, we are not addressing the risk issue in a comprehensive way. It's interesting that you have brought that sort of full spectrum in terms of the change and the, the perspective that's changed over the last 30 years. I'm also quite curious about what the catalyst for change was for that. Because you've mentioned the, the, the development piece, the economic side, the political side as well. So... What do you think has been the catalyst for some of this? Because it's also, as you've correctly stated, it's a shift from a more technical sphere with engineering to also a more risk management piece. So what do you think has been a catalyst for a lot of this change over the last few decades? Yeah, well, first, I would say that the better understanding of risk has helped a lot in generating this change. But secondly, and also quite important, I think that the fact that Every year, after year, after year, the resources that are needed to cope with the humanitarian emergencies is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, in, in, in the case of the United Nations, for example, there are humanitarian appeals. And in the last uh, years, they have been largely underfunded. And every year, there is a request for more and more resources, and we are already into the billions of dollars, you know. Now, with the recent emergencies, including including the war in Ukraine, this year has, hasn't been any different from others. And the pressure on the overseas development assistance and the humanitarian assistance is growing exponentially because, you know, more disasters happen, more people are affected, and more humanitarian funding is needed. And I think that that's another element that has acted as a catalyst in uh, 
shifting this mind of sorting the problem once it happens to trying to sort out the problem before it happens so that the needs on the humanitarian side are not so big. And this is another factor, I think, that has made a big change and it continues to do so, is the fact that disaster management was absolutely a topic that was the responsibility of the civil protection agencies or the emergency management agencies. And of course, all the responders were engaged, the police, the firefighters, the military, etc., and, and the health sector and the water and sanitation sector, et cetera, et cetera, they were all involved, but from the emergency response perspective. But disaster risk reduction actually has to do with every single sector of a government's activities. So it has to do with financing, as it has to do with culture and public works and uh, housing and urban development and health and really every sector is absolutely vital to uh, reach this goal of reducing disaster risk and making it cross-cutting across all these sectors has been also a change that I, I mean, I, it's just starting to happen, but in many countries it has already evolved a multi-sectoral approach towards risk reduction that helps a lot. And, and that has also been, I think, a catalyst in this change. And then fourthly, I would say that the international community through the UN has also been doing a lot of effort to try to support governments and people better understand the issue through international agreements that have occurred in the past uh, three, four decades, starting with the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, moving on to the uh, Yokohama Plan of Action to Reduce Disaster Risk, to the Hyogo Framework for Action, and finally the Sendai Framework, which is the current international framework that member states of the United Nations have adopted to um, try to reduce disaster risk between 2015 to 2030. And this last international agreement, the Sendai Framework, is closely linked with the Sustainable Development Goals. It's closely linked with the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. And it's closely linked also with other international processes that are closely related with issues that are also quite interlinked with disaster risk reduction, such as the water decades or the Convention of Biodiversity and, uh, you know, the new urban agenda and others that are absolutely intimately linked from the issue of, of disaster risk and, and cannot be separated or looked at in, in a siloed uh, fashion. So this, I think, has also been an important catalyst. But definitely, I would say that perhaps the most important catalyst has been the fact that disasters are happening more frequently and more intensely, and in places where in the past they did not happen. So the amplification that climate change has brought to the disaster risk reduction agenda is very, very important and has been another catalyst for this. So then, if you know, as we're looking into the future and we're starting to, you know, say forecast or or discuss what we might see as future events in terms of disaster risk, risk reduction field. If we have had so much sort of investment in the response side of the house, so to speak, and, and the recovery costs and rebuilding after disasters, and they've come to be more frequent, more intensive, and as, it, as you've correctly stated, it's sort of amplified that exposure. Are we seeing the investment now move to the reduction side, to the mitigation side, to the prevention side? So are you starting to see a, a shift in funding so that we can sort of re, you know reduce the overall impact of these disasters? Is that and sort of ebb and flow with the funding that we're seeing? Or do nations still have problems fulfilling the huge request for funding and then also now have to also invest in mitigation and, and risk reduction itself? Yeah, unfortunately, the funding flows are absolutely not at the level that they should be. And, you know, we have we have data from, from my previous position with the UN. Uh, we had a very uh, stark comparison between how much is being used for humanitarian assistance, for example, and what percentage of that is being used or allocated specifically to disaster risk reduction activities 
and it's just 10 cents of a dollar for that purpose as compared to what is being invested in um, disaster response. Similarly with what's invested in, in, in development. And of course, as I was saying, many people are of the opinion that the funding for reducing disaster risk has to come from the development budgets, not from the humanitarian budgets, which I think is correct. However, I also think that you can also do risk reduction during the humanitarian response. And we have been working in the UN very closely with the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, for example, to make sure that all the humanitarian planning cycles do also incorporate risk reduction measures so that they do not contribute into generating more risk. One key example, I participated in many uh, humanitarian uh, operations uh, as member of the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And I can remember two cases at least when uh, the decision was made to uh, create a camp for people that had been uh, affected and needed to move elsewhere. And uh, we set up a camp in an area that happened to be a flood-prone area. And this was not considered in the decision-making process. So as soon as the rainy season started, this uh, refugee area started to get flooded. And then, you know, <laughs> problem again, and you had to change the location. And then that, of course, requires investment and generates a lot of problems for the people affected. They get affected twice, not only once. And uh, this was just one example. Another example is when uh, we were responding to uh, hurricane uh, situations in, in Caribbean countries, and we could immediately see that the roofs of, of homes that had not followed the building code for high winds were the ones being affected. The other ones were okay. And in the recovery phase, we were providing building material to uh, you know replace the roofing and correct some minor damages. And with a simple explanation of how to fix the, the roofing into the structure, you could actually already contribute to reducing future risk. So it's very important that that link is also made. But by and large, going back to the funding issue, we need to insist with governments and the uh, international development uh, assistance community to make sure that disaster risk reduction is actually funded in a more predictable and substantive way. And this we have been discussing also with the climate change community, because, you know, now with the pledges of governments to provide uh, billions of dollars in funding for adaptation, for example, adaptation is just the other side of the coin of risk reduction, because climate change is happening because mostly, mostly the intensification of hydrometeorological events and that are related with excess of water or absence of uh, water precipitation and precipitation. So you are dealing either with very intense uh, floods, flash floods, and you are also dealing with droughts and, and very intense droughts in some cases. You know, it's disaster risk management. The only thing that we need to make sure now is that we incorporate climate change scenarios into the future planning so that we don't allow this, uh, you know, what I was mentioning, the creation of new risk by ignoring all these aspects. Of course, the risk financing has to also be tackled through the amounts of resources that are being put into climate change adaptation particularly. This is a very political issue, but there are actually the COP27 is happening as we speak now in Sharm el-Sheikh in, in Egypt. And governments are discussing about the issue of loss and damage and adaptation. And these are becoming now the hot topics on the table. You know, of course, the mitigation aspects, meaning the reduction of greenhouse gases, is very important. And we need to try to continue towards avoiding more than a 1.5 Celsius uh, centigrade uh, increase in, in, in global temperature. But it's also very important that we take care of the issue of adaptation, because if we don't, then the uh, spiraling of uh, disasters happening 
more frequently is going to go out of control. And that's why the climate financing has to also contribute to the risk reduction financing aspects. So then in the future, if we're seeing a move into adaptation, as you mentioned, is just a, another sort of perspective on, on risk management. And then, and that's where the money is flowing. I mean, ultimately, who is going to be responsible for integration of the risk reduction platforms with everything else that's going on, either the adaptation piece or the humanitarian response? Who ultimately, at the end of the day, is going to be responsible for the integration of all these different perspectives? I mean, your point is well taken in terms of delivering of humanitarian assistance. I mean, you're there to help and you put people in a, a higher risk area and, and, you know, then that disaster happens twice, essentially, or they're affected twice in that population. And you want to prevent that. So who is ultimately going to be the authority that is responsible for the integration of those concepts? Thanks for that question, Kyle, because I think it's very important. And it has to do with risk governance. And this is an area where governments still have to work a lot because, you know, disaster management agencies, as we discussed, are usually part of some ministries or or governance structures that are different than, for example, the environmental uh, secretariat or ministry for the environment, which falls under a different authority. And they are usually not well connected. So sometimes the people dealing with disaster management and disaster risk reduction do not interact actively with people dealing with climate change and adaptation. That's a problem. And we have been emphasizing and these international agreements that I was referring to have been emphasizing on the need to strengthen disaster risk governance to make sure that there is a whole of government approach towards risk reduction and to avoid this uh, compartmentalized approach that actually doesn't lead to any positive uh, result. Governments, of course, are responsible and they are recognized as the main responsible party for risk reduction, but actually they cannot do it alone. So they need civil society, the private sector, industries and and commerces, they need an involvement and engagement of all the actors to make it really possible. Otherwise, governments by themselves, they don't have the means or the capacity to influence all actions of the different layers of society to actually uh, reach this goal. And this is why we also promote, and I'm a strong believer in it, of this whole of society approach towards risk reduction. Uh, But this has to do, of course, with government leadership. And if there is a risk governance that is weak, underfunded, and uh, lacks the technical capacity, then, of course, you know, the result is going to be quite evident. That country or that city or, or area are going to be adversely affected by hazards in the future. In contrast, if this risk governance is uh, structured at the highest level, has this cross-sector responsibility and authority, is well-funded and supported through legislation, then that community will be much more resilient and will will, uh, achieve the sustainable development goals and will thrive much better off than the other one. So, as we say, it's all about risk governance. Of course, this is not an issue that is easily solved. It takes the uh, involvement of the legislative. It takes the involvement of the communities and the private sector, of course. It doesn't happen from night to today. It takes process. But if we don't start now, then we are just going to be delaying the process and kicking the, the bucket to somebody else and then. Actually, the most vulnerable population is the one that pays the highest price at the end of the day. And and we have to make sure that, as the sustainable development goals clearly say, we have to avoid leaving anybody behind. And, you know, there are groups of population, we know very well who they are, and they are actually the ones that are being affected disproportionately. So that's why we have to also focus our attention more on those people as a priority. You know, I've seen that as myself a few times in some of the international work that we've done, that there's often a, 
correlation, we could say, between the type of risk that you're facing and the naming of that risk and then the department that it has to handle it, right? And so if you have an, an a climate risk that's going to the Department for Environment or Ministry of Environment and Planning, you know, and so there's a sort of sometimes a correlation in the naming alone without the recognition that it's a lot more than just that. It's investment, it's regulatory issues, it's legal issues and frameworks and even gets down into, like you said, the risk governance, but even sometimes even in the, um, the sort of the structures in terms of like the terms we use in the United States, as far as municipal, state, you know, and, and federal level responsibilities and overall governance structures and, and what those legal responsibilities are. And so it, it's far more complicated in terms of just asking somebody to fix something. It requires a systemic approach and, a, and really a shift in the way that we're thinking about a lot of these things. So what are the, some of the ways that you've seen and have been, you know, tools in the toolkit to try and get nations to recognize that we have to change our perspective to come up with a whole of government approach to these things, to include civil society and private sector? What are some of the most uh, effective tools that you've seen in your toolkit that you've used to be able to sort of influence nations to go into a certain direction? I would say that, you know, the most important tool to achieve risk reduction is to follow what the Sendai framework is suggesting. This is a very comprehensive framework, and it has already um, agreed on some global targets. And for each one of the global targets, there are a number of indicators that countries are following up on, and it has a number of guiding principles of how disaster risk reduction needs to be approached. That includes, by the way, also some human rights issues. It includes priority areas for action, and it describes what is the responsibility at the national level, the local level, and also the international level. And I think that in terms of, of having a good recipe to reduce disaster risk, the Sendai framework is the best we have. It talks about the, the whole of society engagement. It, it talks about the whole of government uh, engagement. It talks about the uh, most vulnerable. It uh, has been, in a way, each segment of the Sendai framework has been further developed and unpacked to offer specific tools on, for example, how to develop a strong national disaster risk reduction strategy or a local disaster risk reduction strategy, how to ensure engagement of the whole of society, actors, etc., etc. So I think that I couldn't think of any better tool kit than what the Sendai framework offers and what it also offers uh, from the risk reduction community uh, in the sense of how to bring this theory into action. And for that, you know, we have websites like Prevention Web that uh, have a load of uh, resources for people to look into. For example, even if you want to talk about risk financing, you can dive deeper into the issue. And if you are looking more into how to build back better or how to deal with the issue of uh, resilient infrastructure and many, many topics, you, you can actually go and look at, at it and, and find a lot of resources that can be quite helpful. And we are at the midpoint of this Sendai framework implementation because it was an agreement that was adopted in 2015 until 2030. So we, we are at the midpoint. And there is going to be a very interesting exercise next year because the General Assembly of the UN will have a high-level meeting dedicated to the analysis of how, how well are we doing or not in terms of achieving the goals and the priorities for action of the Sendai framework. So this next, um, this will take place in May in New York, by the way, next year. So we have, we have only six more months, basically, where the international uh, community is going to be discussing about this issue. And it's interesting because it's also happening at the same time that there is a stock take exercise for the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So, uh, politically speaking, in the international arena, there is going to be a lot discussion, a lot of discussion about how to better address risk to try to reach the goals that were set 
by this and that framework and the sustainable development goals. So it's going to be quite interesting. And I will be, of course, following up very closely on how this evolves. And this, of course, the uh, COP27 in, in China, Sheik, as I was mentioning uh, just a uh, short while ago, is going to be also quite important because this agenda of adaptation, loss and damage, and, and so on is going to be central on, on the discussions. And so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to see what comes out of the uh, May high-level meeting of the General Assembly, because it's supposed to come up with a political declaration. And uh, I'm going, I'm, I'm most set, certain that it's going to come up with a call for stronger government uh, engagement, funding, and prioritization of disaster risk if we really want to achieve the sustainable development goals. Because if we keep with the trend that we are currently going, we will not be able to reach the sustainable development goals by and large because of the impact that disasters have on countries that are trying to reach these goals. So this, this is my, my, my personal view on how things are going to evolve in the next months. If we're forecasting into the future and, and you know, we're, we're moving into this new phase. So we've, we've sort of talked about you know, the responsibility of nations to be able to have an integrated integrated and sort of whole of government approach to these things and that we're all behind in terms of implementing SDGs. And what does the future hold in? Like what sort of keeps you up at night in terms of disaster risk reduction and, and what you see if you were to, you know, have a chance to look into the future? What are, the, what are some of the issues that you see that are coming up that we need to be aware of or at least keep an eye on? Unfortunately, there, there are lots of things that, uh, that could go wrong. <laughs> and this is something that worries me, and I think that worries many people uh, around the world. I think that um, we live in an era, era of uncertainty. I think that if, if there is something that characterizes our time nowadays, is uncertainty. And we have uncertainty also in the area of uh, risk. The, the risk landscape is changing so quickly and so dramatically that it is very difficult to even anticipate what may be the situation that we are going to be facing two years down the road. You know, with the conflict in Ukraine, everybody starts thinking about how that, that could potentially escalate into even uh, nuclear warfare and uh, other sorts of, uh, you know, ramifications of that. There are uh, lots of um, concerns about uh, the polarization that the world is also seeing currently uh, with the U.S. and China and, and Europe being quite opposing in, in, in their views of how the global economy and the global order should follow. And, and that in itself can generate, you know, a lot of um, financial and economic challenges that may bring risks that we could not have thought of. So this is just a few to mention, but there could also have further ramifications of climate change as it keeps on not being aligned to this uh, intention of, of, of limiting the, the increase in global temperature to the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that can cause things that are related to biological hazards and also environmental hazards. This is another issue that I think is going to change a lot because most of the time, emergency managers are more focusing on the natural hazards and the technological hazards, but not so much on the environmental and the biological hazards. And we could very well be uh, facing similar pandemics as the one we had with COVID-19, which, by the way, it's still ongoing, but we could fall into a, another pandemic from a different type of virus in a short period of time after having gone through one of the wars in the past hundred years. So there are lots of uncertainties, and we have to start shaping up the way in which we address risk also taking into account the fact that we are living in an era of uncertainty. And we have to start looking at the possible connections and um, the interaction of different hazards that can create situations that we have potentially not seen in the past and that we have to be somehow 
thinking and trying to anticipate so that the impact is not going to be so great. So it's, it's a very challenging time. It's an uncertain time. And as I said, the, the risk landscape is indeed changing very rapidly. I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, it, it is changing rapidly and we're also seeing sort of concurrent and and like I think you mentioned already, cascading effects between these different types of incidents that are occurring and, and all sort of, in my view, the sort of all sort of started with Japan and a tsunami and we started to come to a realization of the effects of cascading effects from a, you know, an earthquake to a tsunami to a nuclear sort of issue coming up an emergency. And I don't know, and obviously I could be wrong, but I don't know that we're fully sort of cognizant and aware and prepared for all of that to be occurring all at the same time, given the sort of lack of resilience in supply chains and infrastructure and everything else that we would need to be robust in order to be able to respond to systemic effects and shocks that happen sort of consistently and even periodically throughout our daily lives. These are obviously large sort of, you know, political and 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 strategic problems. But when we bring the conversation back down to the individual communities and the cities and, and people who may be emergency managers in their locale or in their town or, or city or whatever the case is, you know, what are some of the things that they should really be looking at today, you know, that they should be looking at for their communities uh, from the perspective of somebody like yourself who was working at the United Nations level on disaster risk reduction? What would somebody in their position, should they focus on while others are sort of handling these larger geopolitical and strategic issues? Yes, I, I, I think that, uh, well, first, fortunately, at the strategic level, also things are happening. And for example, you now see that groups as the G20, you know, the, the 20 most uh, influential economies in the world are starting to deal with this issue. And they, they are actually in the, in the upcoming meeting of, of the G20 in Indonesia. Th there is a uh, proposal being tabled by, by India to establish a working group on, on, on risk uh, reduction at the G20. So this gives signs that, you know, even at this high political level and strategic level, these things are starting to be taken into account, which is great. But going to the community level again, I think that the communities, what they should do is they should put some pressure on their elected officials so that the understanding of disaster risk is brought to a higher level. There are very few communities that have a multi-hazard risk assessment, for example. And that's where everything starts, you know, because if, I mean, in order to start taking action, you need to be sure of what are you working to change or to avoid or to solve. So if you don't know that, you are going to be obviously not going into the precise point you want to go. And um, so the approach towards risk reduction is also changing from the uh, risk assessment side. And as I said, we have to move from a, a risk assessment that is focused on one hazard only, but look at the potential connections with other hazards. And we, when, when I was at, at UNDRR, we, we did develop a concept that is now being already operationalized, which presents the, the um, fact that you need to first have sufficient data related to uh, the hazard, the vulnerability, and the exposure, and have that in a place which can be used by different potential sectors so that they can start thinking about how they could potentially be affected by these hazards and the combinations of hazards. And once they have that, which, uh, you know, it's, it's a good risk information portal, let's say, you can start looking at and, and having discussions, what we refer to the bespoke analytics. So engaging all actors of community and sectors to start discussing about how that specific hazard or combination of hazards can affect their well-being or their operations or their objectives. And this dialogue can bring some solutions that can be implemented 
to address the issues that have been identified as, as priorities for the, for the community. Of course, you know, when you deal with these issues, you always have to prioritize because resources are finite and you cannot do everything you want to do because there aren't sufficient resources to do that. So you have to prioritize, but this prioritization um, effort has to be done also with the participation of all the sectors because otherwise it, it can be biased, it can be sector specific, and that can potentially de- lead to ignoring some very important aspects that were not uh, taken into account because sometimes, you know, you have even group think effects. But if you are just dealing with one specific sector, that sector is inherently biased and will not take into the views of others that can be equally important or even more important than that being brought by this specific sector. So I think that that's the way to tackling this issue. So we need to have civil society be a voice that triggers or elicits the action of elected officials into this issue and take it as a, as a key priority for good governance and for building of resilience of, of communities. And I think that's an important point and a, and a great point to sort of end up on since we, we've got a little bit long here, but it's been really interesting conversation. And and I think we can't discount the fact that, you know, in many, many nations, you know, there's still a lot of issues behind interagency cooperation and communication and the fact that we divide a lot of these responsibilities. But we do need to pick up on the fact that this really does require a whole of government approach to respond to these, you know, multi-hazard, multi-domain sort of complex disasters and emergencies we're facing these days. And so at a community level, it's just that even just that engagement of even though it might be health in one sector and, you know, response in another agency or department or whatever the case is, that communication and engagement. And I think you really hit on a point, which is civil society. Even if you're making plans, socializing these plans, bringing it to the community and doing that, even though we may not like the feedback. Right. And taking that criticism and sort of moving forward with it and, you know, socializing these things so that the communities are individually aware. But Ricardo, thank you very much for being here today. It was a very interesting conversation hearing your perspective, especially for someone that's worked so long in the United Nations and has been part of many of these important discussions over the last 30 years. I really do appreciate it. And if, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, where can what's the best way to find you? I think that uh, LinkedIn would be the best uh, way, Kyle. And then I want to thank you also very much for this uh, interview. I, I have also enjoyed it quite a lot and a pleasure. And I hope that we will have in the future, hopefully, new opportunities to discuss about uh, things that we discussed here, because many are going to be moving, you know, uh, and evolving. So from time to time, we can catch up. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks once again for joining us. Thank you, Kyle. Have a great day.